Thanks for joining us for our webinar on the fall corn and soybean outlook. I'm Jim Minter, director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's a professor in ag economics and also the associate director of the center. Michael, we're talking about the outlook today because USDA released a couple of big reports this afternoon. They is issued the September crop production report, which people have been anxiously awaiting since the August report. And of course, they also updated the world ag supply demand estimate. So there's a lot of information to cover and uh, let's just kind of jump right in. So USDA reduced the corn yield, the national average corn yield by nearly three bushels per acre compared to August. And that's the number people have been debating ever since that storm came through Iowa just a couple of days, well really, I, I think just a day or so before mm -hmm. the August crop report came out, but after they did their survey. So that did have some influence. It did pull the numbers down, maybe a little more than some people were expecting, maybe uh, certainly more than we thought back on August 11th, I think. Um, and as you look at it on a state-by-state -state basis, Michael, I think you took a little closer look at this. There's a, been some big changes. Yeah, as, as you said, most, most people are focusing on Iowa there, and there was a large reduction uh, in, in the yield expectation for Iowa, five and a half bushel uh, on this map. But it's very important to point out that there's several states that are going to have, look like they're going to have record yields, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Kentucky, and, and uh, Michigan, and so there's, you know, and so and so offsetting uh, some of that decline in, in Iowa is is some record yields in some of these other states. Yeah, it's interesting. The yield reductions were really kind of a, what I characterize as the central corn belt. The northern corn belt came through this relatively well, yeah. with the exception being Iowa being kind of on the fringe of that northern area. And area. their crop ratings are substantially better. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the good and excellent, there they've got at least at least 15 percent higher good, excellent than some of, the, some, of the, some of the main Corn Belt states. So one of the factors I think pulling down yields in Iowa and, and nationally was the storm that came through and that was got, that generated yeah. so much of the discussion. But the other factor was the fact that crop conditions, the ratings have really declined pretty sharply in recent weeks, largely because of dry weather. Yeah, the, the drought map continues to get more dark, more dark red, which means that there's more of a, more of a severe drought uh, not just dry conditions, and so that certainly impacted the yields in Iowa. Yeah, if very, you look at excellent, I think there's less than five percent of the corn in Iowa is, is rated as excellent right now. Yeah, so we're going to see a little different picture with respect to soybean yields, and part of that's because of that late influence yeah. of those declines in crop condition ratings. So in terms of corn production, that pulls us down pretty substantially because the other thing USDA did was they reduced a little bit the estimate of harvested acreage. So you put that reduction in harvested acreage along with that reduction in yield, that pulled production down by almost 400 million bushels. I think the estimate was 378. So that pulls us down below 15 billion bushels. And we, of course, we've been talking about corn yield or corn production being above 15 billion bushels pretty much all year. Yeah. So now we're finally below that 15 billion mark at 14.9. That's still a big increase compared to last year and actually the biggest corn crop since the 2016 crop. So it's still a relatively large crop, but smaller than what we thought a few weeks ago, and I think that's probably the key. And as you look at it from the trade perspective, this one was probably pretty much in the middle of trade expectations. Uh, last time, USDA was a little on the high side relative to what people in the trade were expecting coming into the report. This time, pretty much you know, middle of the road, so no big shock there. And I think if you look at the way prices responded this afternoon, um, that indicates the market was expecting a number pretty close to this. We saw a modest uptick in yeah. corn prices, but yeah. very small. I think when yeah. uh, we came over to, to record this, I think it was uh, up about three cents. Yeah. So a fairly modest re uh, reaction in the futures market, indicating that people were expecting these kind of numbers. One of the things, though, you and I have been talking about for a while is ethanol and uh, what impact that's going to have. And, and USDA was a little less optimistic this month than they were a month earlier, uh, but they're still projecting recovery. They've got uh, corn going into ethanol production at 5.1 billion bushels. That's down a little bit from where they were a month ago, but that's still up from the 2019 estimate of 4.86 billion. And I continue to think that that might be just a little optimistic. And if you look at what's taken place with ethanol production on a weekly basis, this chart looks at um, the change in U.S. weekly ethanol production relative to the first week of January. It just kind of walks through the year. And of course, you can see the big reductions in the spring. Uh, at one point, we were running about 50% below where we were in early January. 
But notice on the right hand side of that chart that we've kind of leveled off at about 14, 15, 16 percent below where we were. And I think that's really the, the troubling part about the ethanol uh, forecast. Yeah, definitely. Particularly when you look at, uh, you know, it goes all the way back to June. Uh, you know, late June when we had that, you know, we were in the, in the same range as we are today. I, I thought we'd see more improvement than that. Yeah, so as, as I think about it for the rest of this year, I find it difficult to get very optimistic about further increases in yeah. ethanol usage for corn. Um, my best guess is we're going to see this stall out in that range of where it is right now. And that makes me think USJ's forecast might be a little optimistic. So uh, for them to be right, I think what's going to have to happen is to see a bigger recovery after the first of the year. And that could happen. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that remains to be seen. But that's a little bit of a wild card with respect to usage. Um, this is also a wild card. They're pretty optimistic about exports. Uh, they're projecting a 32% increase in corn exports for the 2020 crop. That's 100 million bushel more than they were forecasting a month ago. And of course, a lot of this is tied to what's going on in Asia, especially China, right? And, and the um, prospects for improved uh, meat production in China, increasing demand for uh, not only soybeans and soybean meal, but also corn. And I think that's really what's driving a lot of this and uh, truthfully been driving the market the last few weeks, right? And, and, and they're also probably anticipating some continued strength in the world economy. Uh, in addition to the China situation, uh, you know, support this high export, you're going to have to have that. Yeah, so, as, and as we know, rising incomes around the world increase demand for meat, and that's really what drives corn exports and to some extent all of these uh, soybean exports as well. So, uh, but a big chunk of that is one country, China, yes, yes right? It is. So that remains a wild card. Um, when you look at that reduction in production and that increase in usage, that pulls down the ending stocks expressed as a percentage of usage from 19% a month ago to 17% this month. And as you look at the chart, that's about where we've been in recent years, 16, 17%. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen the, those days of uh, seeing those uh, uh, ending stocks as a percentage of usage below 10%. We're yeah. not anywhere close to that. But it is a movement in the right direction from a standpoint of tightening uh, ending stocks going into the 2021 corn harvest, yeah. right? And we were worried about 20%. I mean, it was 19% last month, but we were we were, had some concerns. It might even be 20%. So this is certainly good news. Yeah, so that that kind of explains the tightening, and it also explains why there's maybe just a little bit of strength in the corn market, but it also indicates why we didn't get a big reaction today, yeah. right? It really wasn't a big shock or a big, big move. But the, maybe the surprise, uh, at least to some folks, I think, was the fact that USDA did increase their marketing year average corn price forecast by 40 cents a bushel to 350. It was all the way down to 310 a month ago, which was a big reduction from the prior month. Yeah. So we've really been kind of on a yo-yo with respect to these marketing year average price forecast. Um, so if you look at it, that puts us up pretty close to the 19 estimate of 360. Uh, a little later in the broadcast, we're going to talk a little bit about the implications for that with respect to government payments, because you're going to take a closer look at that. Um, but what's your reaction there, Michael? Uh, I was going to ask you a question, so I'll, I'll just throw it back to you. What would have to take place for that to be above last year's prices? Is, is there much chance uh, for that continuing to strength? We've seen a lot of, you know, like, as you've indicated, we've seen a lot of, a lot of strength here in the last few weeks. That's a good question. So, you know, I think to see some additional strength, the first thing would be maybe an indication that the yields were lower than what USDA forecast on this uh, round of reports. That would be one. Uh, maybe even more strength on the export side than what we've already seen. And then the third one would be if what happens if uh, ethanol does in fact start to recover more rapidly than what we suggested on that chart if you, uh, that we just showed where we were looking at those 14, 15 percent below the beginning of the year at production levels. What if it all of a sudden uh, this fall jumps back up even with where it was in early January. I think those would be the three factors that, that I would look at to, to uh, really see some strength above uh, not only that 350, but as you mentioned, maybe all the way above that 360. I don't yeah. think that's very likely, but it's possible. Right? But it, it seems more likely to be 360 than $3. And so, you know, that's what we were looking at last month. And so certainly that, this, is, this is good news. Where do we were a month ago? So let's take a look at the corn market pricing structure. This is the structure that existed uh, late afternoon here, just before the market was getting ready to close. 
uh, with Dece at 368, March at 378, uh, May at 384, and July at 388. So a modest premium built into the futures market, a modest incentive to store. Um, I guess the other thing I would think about there is based on some of the research that uh, Nathan Thompson and our department has done uh, looking at uh, these spreads over time, there's a pretty strong tendency for those spreads to strengthen or increase as you head into harvest and especially as you get into that late harvest time frame. So I would look for the possibility of seeing those spreads increase. And if you want to do some pricing, the implication is you'd probably want to do it in the nearby uh, and then look for those spreads to strengthen if you're looking at a storage opportunity. Uh, look for those spreads to strengthen and then roll forward into one of the deferred contracts, uh, maybe closer to the end of that storage season that, that you're looking at. So there's going to be some possibilities for storage on corn, I think, is, is the message. It's not a real strong incentive today, but there is some possibilities there. And on the basis side, this is uh, from the uh, Purdue's uh, Center for Com Commercial Agriculture Crop Basis Tool that, again, Nathan Thompson updated for us this morning. So if you look at the tool, the black line is what's taking place right now. Those are most recent basis estimates up through Wednesday of this week. And then the blue line is the three-year average, the most uh, recent three-year average. And this is for central Indiana. So you can pick whatever part of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, or Ohio that you want to look at uh, to, based on uh, the crop reporting district you live in. But as you look at it, um, I think we're probably likely to see some weakening in basis as we get into corn harvest. We haven't hit that yet. There really hasn't been any appreciable corn harvest take place. As, as harvest gets underway, we're likely to see some weakening. I don't know if we'll get it all the way down to that three-year average or not, but we'll probably get relatively close. But as you look at it, and this particular chart was computed off of the July futures, so we're using July futures to trace what's happening with basis throughout the course of the storage season. And you can see the strengthening that typically takes place, and I think that's probably the pattern we're going to see. So if you're looking for an opportunity to improve your corn returns, one thing to think about, and if you wanted to do some pricing today, would be to perhaps place a hedge in the nearby December, look for those spreads to widen as we move through the fall, uh, and then capture the basis increase that takes place post-harvest into that mid to late spring time frame. And, and so there's an opportunity to actually pr improve returns and improve profitability, and uh, I'd encourage folks to think about that. Let's kind of change gears a little bit and talk about soybeans, Michael. So soybean yields, this is something you've been looking at. Yeah, it's still considerably above trend, and so there could be some more downward adjustment on this. This is still kind of an open question, uh, though it's getting closer to, <laughs> closer to the time where that'll be final. But uh, now they came down a, a, bushel, a bushel and a half uh, from the previous month. Yeah, um, so we're still at that roughly 52 bushels per acre. And I think your point is, if you look at those crop condition ratings, they've been deteriorating pretty sharply in recent weeks. And that has a bigger influence on soybean yields this time of year yeah. than corn. So there is more risk on the soybean yield side at, from this point going forward, right? We've still got some yes. weather opportunities, or at least for a week or two, maybe a little longer, on, particularly on some of the late season uh, soybeans. So maybe a little more question mark on the yield. I don't feel like there's going to be as much question mark on the corn yield except for the storm impact. Yes. Which is still a little bit of an unknown, even with the survey. Uh, on the soybean side, weather still has a role to play here, doesn't it? Definitely. And if you look at the state numbers, again, yeah, you've looked at those. Yeah, we're down substantially in Iowa, uh, obviously, down in, down in Michigan, but, but quite a few of the, the Corn Belt states there. Ohio is, Ohio is down from the previous month, still a record in Ohio. Uh, Indiana's at 60, uh, 60 bushel uh, estimate, down a bushel and a half from the previous month. Uh, Illinois at 62, down three bushel. And so we're seeing, seeing some weakness across that, across that Corn Belt. But again, look at Minnesota. Uh, you know, Minnesota is going to looks like they're going to have record record yields. Kentucky uh, record soybean yields, and so and so it's certainly a, a, a diversity here uh, in terms of in terms of uh, soybeans compared to a month ago. And that map does look different than the corn yield map because in the corn yield map, the northern corn belt was looking still pretty strong. And as you mentioned, Minnesota still looks pretty good in this map, but the other northern uh, tier states aren't as good. Aren't as good. So that dry weather yeah. is having some impact there, and maybe could have some more yeah. impact. Right. And particular South Dakota. I mean, South Dakota was having record corn yields. Well, they're they're down quite a bit on their soybean yield, and it's it's certainly not a record this year compared to previous years. And so, so you're right. Uh, it's not the same map. Yeah, it's a little bit of a different, and, uh, and as you mentioned, of course, Iowa was hit pretty hard, just as it was in corn. 
So if you compare that to the August estimate, that brings soybean production down about 112 million bushels to 4.3 billion bushels, up just like corn substantially compared to last year because we were down so hard compared uh, in last year, but actually gets us up pretty close to where we were two years ago. Not quite all the way, it just pulls us down a little bit, but uh, uh, not, not the magnitude of reduction that we saw on the, um, on the corn side. But as we saw, we're seeing really a bigger re reaction on soybeans than we are on corn. And so this slide maybe hints at it a little bit. If you look at the industry expectations coming into this report versus what USDA released today, at first glance, that looks like it's kind of middle of the pack. But really what happens there is if you look closely, the observations, there were more people uh, had, a, had a smaller Blown. estimate what, than what USDA did, right? So very, very interesting what's, what's going on there. Um, and then if you look at uh, the exports, USDA did not change their export forecast for soybeans compared to last month. However, they had an extremely optimistic export forecast a month ago, and we questioned that when we yeah. looked at the report a month ago, um, that we we're already 27 percent above the 2019 export figure. So, And very close to the 16 and 17. Yeah, it is. And yeah. so... Clearly, what's being uh, built into that forecast is a strong increase in exports to China. And a lot of that is obviously tied to what's taking place in the livestock industry. And it's very difficult to get a very accurate handle on exactly what's going on with the livestock sector in China, particularly with respect to the pork industry. But the news stories would suggest there's a tremendous amount of activity trying to rebuild the pork industry in China. Um, not only from, from a profitability standpoint, but also from a standpoint of government subsidies being uh, put in place to encourage uh, rebuilding that sector. So uh, that forecast is assuming that we're gonna see a, an increase in exports to China, uh, a rather substantial one, and that's what's been taking place in recent weeks. Yeah. If you look at the sales notices that have been coming out from USDA, uh, it suggests we are picking up those sales pretty dramatically. Yeah. Yeah, if you ignored this chart and just looked at the production chart, and you had 4.3 billion bushels, you'd be a little bit worried. <laughs> but yeah. that's, that's, how, that's how you can have a, a decent soybean price. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, you, stronger exports certainly contribute to that increase in soybean prices we've seen. Yeah, good point. So the ending stocks chart for soybeans is what really looks encouraging. And that's, I think, what drove the increase in prices that we saw the af this afternoon. I think soybean futures prices this afternoon were up about 18 cents, or roughly. Uh, on most of the contracts compared to what they were before the open. Uh, and as you look at the ending stocks, um, coming down to 10%. And, and you know, in my mind, Michael, that 10% is, is sort of a line of demarcation. Yes. You see ending stocks as a percentage of usage drop below 10% and things can get interesting in a hurry. And we're kind of on the bubble right now, right, at that 10%. Yeah. Um, and on the way over today, we were talking a little bit about, you know, what, what could drive this. And again, you were talking about impact on yields with respect to corn. I think there's a little bit of a wild card here with respect to yields on soybeans. Yes, definitely. And so that could tighten a little more if the yields are not quite as good as what USDA well, was or suggesting. Or if exports are not quite as good as what they're anticipating or it better. It could go the other way. Yeah, it could go either better, way. Yeah, it, yeah. it could be below 10%. Uh, but, but I think the key point is those stocks have really tightened. You go back two years ago, we had 23% carryover, 15% coming out of the 19 crop, 10% 10%. projected coming out of the 20 crop. You know, as a, as a soybean producer, you got to like the trend on that chart, right, in terms of the improvement uh, and the reduction in those ending stocks. Um, USDA did raise their marketing year average price forecast by 90 cents a bushel today. Uh, I didn't have a pre-release expectation on that, but that's a big number. That's, <laughs> that's a big that's move a large in one month, right? Uh, I, don't, I didn't have a database to check that particular statistic, but I don't recall them boosting the marketing year average 90 cents in a month, at least not in recent memory. So that was a big, big move. Uh, and really just changed the profitability picture. And you're going to look at profitability here in a couple of minutes, so we'll talk more about and, that. And this chart's really interesting because corn was pretty flat. If you looked at corn for the last four or five years, it was pretty flat. That 925 puts us at a price that's similar to what it was in 17. Yeah. 
That's a good point. And and and, then, and you you combine that with the fact that there's there's probably more upside on soybeans. We could argue about that, but given that given that yields could come down a little bit, given that perhaps exports could be a little stronger, that you, there's 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 some optimism uh, regarding soybean prices. And I think the key point for our listeners is going to be the fact that that 925 and and related prices. Uh, are going to translate into some pretty good returns relative to corn yes. for soybean production. So we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. This is this afternoon's uh, soybean futures market pricing structure, and that di diagram looks a lot different <laughs> than what I put up for corn. So essentially, the futures aren't providing any incentive to store. Um, and as you look at it, you know that kind of a pricing structure uh, would suggest the market is encouraging some sales to be made at current levels. Uh, again, we were talking about this earlier today. Uh, we think that maybe doing some pricing and taking advantage of this rally might be a, a good strategy to think about. Uh, not with all your production, but if you haven't done much pricing, this might be a good opportunity. Um, if you're going to look at some storage opportunities, though, I wouldn't despair completely. Uh, again, a little bit like corn, we would expect to see those spreads widen out as you get into harvest. Um, and so if you're going to do some pricing uh, and you still want to think about storage, what you could do is place hedges in the nearby the November contract and watch those spreads as we go through the fall. Typically, they would widen out um, in late fall uh, as harvest winds down and comes to a conclusion, perhaps about the time that November contract is uh, uh, getting ready to go off the board or maybe as you move into the delivery month. And then if that, those spreads widen out, you could roll those hedges forward and take advantage of the improvement in the spread. So that would be one consideration to think about. On the basis side, uh, basis right now here in early September is still pretty strong. But as you look at harvest time basis bids, they're quite a bit weaker. And, and so um, my best guess is we'll see those uh, soybean basis levels weaken pretty substantially as we get into harvest. Again, this basis chart is computed off of July futures, so you can do a good job of tracking how basis changes during the course of the storage season. But if I'm right and we see basis weaken substantially this fall, we probably will see a pretty significant recovery in basis into the spring. Uh, but again, you'd want to keep an eye on that. But those two factors could improve the storage returns for soybeans as a little bit like corn. Although I have to say the storage opportunity and the storage returns at this stage look better for corn than they do for soybeans. Now, I, I think you said, maybe you said it, you said it earlier today uh, and not during the webinar, but, but that, that black line for corn is probably going to track uh, the historical. Soybeans might stay a little above. Well, you know what happened with soybeans and it depends. Because that 10 percent. Well, the other thing is the, sure? with, with the soybeans is the fact that we've got that one really negative year when we basically turned off the spigot with respect oh. to sales to China. And that really pulled down that average basis level. And so the average might not be quite as reflective of uh, reality for, for soybeans as it is for corn. Um, so, but I think the bottom line is, if you're thinking about do I want to store corn or soybeans, uh, right now it looks like the returns would favor corn over soybeans. And I think you and I are in agreement on this. If you haven't done much pricing, this looks like an yes. opportunity to, to lock in at least a portion of your, uh, of your sales on soybeans um, based on this rally. So earlier this week, USDA released uh, its government, uh, well, it's, its farm income yeah. forecast. And I'll let you talk about that, Michael. U.S. net farm income was, was higher than a lot of people thought it was going to be. I would believe it, ran, it was about $102, $103 billion uh, you know, dollars, uh, in terms of U.S. net farm income. And, and uh, one of the biggest contributors to that, to that uh, relatively high U.S. net farm income was government payments. And so what we've done here is we've adjusted for inflation, looked at government payments since 1973 all the way to 2020. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, this latest year is the highest during that time period, which might surprise a few people. But it's, it just it just shows how large those government payments are expected to be this year. Yeah, you know, when I looked at this chart, Michael, and it had been a while since I looked at this particular one, I remembered how large those government payments were in the 80s. And what surprised me was, even after adjusting for inflation, uh, yes, this was bigger. Yeah. Now, one of the things about the 1980s, what that made them seem even bigger, is, is net farm income was relatively low. So as a proportion of net farm income, some of those years, the 1980s, 
contributed mightily uh, to, to net farm income. We're going to look at that in the next chart. So I think that's why they, they did seem so large. But I remember also that late 90s, early 2000 period as having really high, uh, really high government payments. And this, this chart shows that, but we're, we're blowing those years out of the water with the 2020 estimate here. Yeah. So it, and I think it's important to point out as well, Michael, that not all these payments are emanating from what we t refer to as the farm bill. No. Right? So the Paycheck Protection Program uh, values are built yeah. into this. I think that was roughly $4.5 billion. Um, CARES Act payments. So And the CARES Act payment affected a lot of commodities, mm -hmm. whereas that's typically, typically not the case. There's usually the, the payments are focused on only a few commodities. There was a lot more commodities that were, that were covered under the CARES Act. So yes. it's important to remember that. So that, that inflates what happened this year. Now those, but those are still dollars going yes. to agriculture, but they did not all emanate yeah. from the farm bill. Oh, yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely related to COVID. There's no, yeah. no ifs, ands, or buts yeah. about that. So you took a look at um, these payments relative to... And we, farm can, income. we can see 2020, I mean, as I indicated, it's a relatively large proportion of, of farm income. But this puts it in perspective. Uh, you know, in the, in the 1980s uh, and, and that, that uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, the government payments were, 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 were smaller, uh, but, the, uh, but, but uh, they, they were a higher percent uh, of, of net farm income than they were in 2020. And so 1987, 1999, 2000, 2001 are labeled there in red. And then we have 1983. 1983 was a very low uh, you, uh, net farm income um, uh, year, and but and 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 the government payments were relatively large, and so they made up 65 percent of, of net farm income in 1983. Uh, the two blue triangles below 2020, I believe, were 1984 and 1986, and so uh, and so those those. Uh, the, those mid-80 periods uh, had, had a relatively large proportion of net farm income uh, uh, corresponded with the government payments. Some of our viewers probably remember 1983 pretty well. That was the year of the PIC program. Yeah, the PIC program. And we really dropped corn acreage pretty dramatically that year. It always shows up in any chart you look at when you look at acreage. So. This is a chart we've been uh, presenting um, on a monthly basis, and it, and it looks a little better uh, this month, uh, but it does put in perspective, even with this improvement in prices for both 2020 and 2021 uh, for, for corn and soybeans, uh, which were important to this chart because looking at corn soybean rotation, we're still looking at relatively no, low net farm income. And that's because the, uh, the, uh, the income, the crop net returns are below break even without the government payments. That's why that, that, those blue, uh, that blue bars are, are below zero there. Um, they're below break even without the government payments. And so it just puts in perspective, uh, you know, even with these uh, improvement in prices and relatively strong government payments, we're, we're looking at some pretty low net farm income uh, in 2020 and 2021. But I have to say, Michael, that chart looks better than the one you presented a month ago. Oh, yes. Because a month ago, the 2020 chart the black triangle, which is net farm income, was, was negative. Was negative, and it was about the same as what yeah. 2015 was. Yes, right? it was. So that's a pretty significant improvement yeah. in just over 30 days, yeah. right? So yeah. that's that is a it is a better picture than we were yeah. pre presenting just a month ago. And one of the things that's happened here is the improvement in, in crop net returns is offset the decline in, in uh, PLC payments to corn. Uh, those payments certainly are going to be lower with 350 corn compared to 310. Uh, but but the but uh, as as is almost always the case, it, your farmers are better off having a good crop with with decent prices uh, than a government payment. Good point. So let's see. This I, I wanted to I, I updated the budgets here uh, the last couple of weeks, and so I wanted to take a, a look at an early look at. Uh, corn versus uh, soybean profitability for 2021. Uh, before we get there, let's look at 2020. Uh, soybeans look like they're going to be more profitable in 2020 compared to, to corn. Uh, that could change a little bit if yields are a little bit lower than what uh, uh, USDA NAS is, is, is currently projecting. But it uh, looks like uh, soybeans were profitable in 2021. Uh, our first look at 2021 looks like soybeans are still pretty competitive. Uh, even though with that improvement of corn, soybeans have improved even more uh, in terms of price. And so soybeans are, are still look like they're going to be more profitable. And that's been the trend here since 2013, with the exception of 2019. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, but really not too surprising no. given what's taken place with respect to soybean prices, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really been the driver here. Uh, and so, you know, as people look to make some plans, and this is the time of year when people are starting to lock in seed sales, uh, seed, seed purchases, uh, give that some thought in terms of what you're going to do with your acreage. 
And then we get lots of questions about cash rent, lots of cash rent discussions have been going on this summer and will continue to go on here in the early fall and, and maybe a little beyond that. So take a look at this. The net return to land has improved about $25 per acre since, since last month. And so, uh, you know, certainly stronger corn and soybean prices have, have made that look better, but we're still $100 below uh, the 2020 cash rent. Uh, and if you assume the same uh, cash rent in uh, in 2021, that's why I have that as a red triangle rather than a blue triangle. That's a projection. Uh, if it remains the same, uh, 2021 is also going to be quite a bit below that cash rent. And so there's still some downward pressure on cash rents. Now, having said that, uh, when you look at a chart, you look at a chart like this, and 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 you look at some of the historical uh, trends in, in cash rent and net return to land, we're looking at a relatively modest adjustment to cash rents. Uh, a chart like this could, there, if cash rents could be five to ten dollars lower, we're not looking at a, a large downward uh, adjustment to cash rent, but we could see a small adjustment. So I'm going to ask you to back up a little bit, Michael, and define for our viewers what you mean by net return to land. Uh, good question. Uh, that means that uh, all cash costs and opportunity costs other than land are accounted for. And so if you own machinery, we're, we're charging you an opportunity cost for that machinery. The same with, with family and operator labor, we're, 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 have a, we're charging an opportunity cost for that cost. And so the only thing not included in that is, is the land cost. Okay. So that's always a little bit of a confusing yes. point. And then I think your point was um, it's tempting to look at a chart like this and look at that gap and say, boy, they're going to have tremendous downward pressure on cash rents. You've looked at that pretty extensively, you and one of your graduate students a few years ago, and you can, came up with some thumb rules for yes. the adjustments. You, what you have to do, what we did is we looked at the cash rent and we looked at lag net return to land and lag cash rent. And the adjustment, if it's just a one year drop in, in net return to land, the adjustment's relatively small that first year. We had a rule of thumb of 10%. So if it's a $100 drop uh, in net return to land, that would translate into a $10 drop in cash rent. Now, if that, if that net return to land stays low, then you're going to see a bigger adjustment over time. But, but uh, uh, that's a very important question because I want to point that out. Um, if, what, if to, to have $250 cash rent in this situation, people have to be expecting that as you go into 2022 and, and down the road, that that net return to land is going to get closer to cash rent. If that's not the case, then that's what I'm assuming when I say that the adjustment could be relatively modest, uh, that we're going to see some improvement in net return to land uh, compared to 2021. Uh, otherwise, we're going to see can, we're going to see an adjustment for two, three, four years in a row. Yeah. So if, looking at the gap for this year for 2020, the gap is a roughly $100. Yes. And it's and it's a $60 drop from 2019. And, and so that's where I say that you know five to ten dollars. You're using that 10 yes. percent is how you came yeah, up with that, with that up range. With that. Okay. And then if that really does get into people's expectations, which is always hard to estimate yeah. what people are looking at, but if people's expectations start to change, you could see a bigger change over time. But we haven't seen that. People have yeah. been resi resistant to making those changes, uh, big changes. However, if you go back in time and look at that chart, maybe in a little more detail, I think this is an interesting chart. If you go back and look at 2015, we had that big gap and, and we did see a significant adjustment in the 16. 16. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's what leads me to think we're yeah. probably going to see some pressure. But the expectations part is huge here because you think about what's yeah. going on this fall with respect to expectations. This is a tough year to and, figure out what expectations are. And I are. think, you know, this is, this is speculation, of course, but I think there was probably more pessimism in 14, 15 because of where we, were, where we had been in previous years. And so that was, that was getting built in uh, to the downward pressure for cash rent. Sitting today, I don't think there's that much pe that's as much, near as much pessimism. I think people are thinking it might go the other direction. Uh, we might actually see net return to land improve here uh, the next two, three, four years. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you're right in the sense that the, the expectations are for a strengthening yeah. in the ag economy as opposed to a weakening. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Well, that kind of wraps up our discussion for today. Uh, appreciate everyone joining us. So more details available on the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture's website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. And of course, we have not only these webinars, but we recently this summer launched a podcast series that you want to tap into as well. And so keep an eye on the website. Uh, we'll be doing some more webinars here this fall. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. On behalf of both my colleague and the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Mintert.